Well, good morning. Today we are back in Romans chapter 12, and I think we're going to finish up uh, the chapter here today. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and, and start flipping over there to Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. And the title for this section of my Bible was Love in Action, so I figured that would just be a fine sermon name. Anyway, so what we've got going on here, you're going to notice when we start reading this passage, there's going to be some changes here uh, in the way Paul is writing and what he's writing about. We're at a point where some things uh, are shifting and previously, if you remember last week, he was talking about gifting, and so we'd work through this whole message about uh, don't think more of ourselves than we ought to, and this, we said this was within the context of God assigning spiritual gifts within the church. We've all been gifted a little bit differently. Don't lift yourself up or don't um, sell yourself short, don't look down on other people, that sort of thing. And then there was an appeal at the end to use our spiritual gifts to glorify God, because that's the whole point. That's why he, he gifted us, is to do that very thing. And so now today, we're moving on to this new section here in the rest of chapter 12, and what he's going to talk about here is he's going to address the attitudes of, of those of us who are expressing the spiritual gifts that God has given us, right? So we're supposed to use the gifts to glorify God, but what should our attitudes <clears throat> be? What should our orientation be? And he's going to talk about love, uh, and he's going to talk about what exactly all of that looks like. And what we're going to see here is uh, there's going to be kind of a style change here as well. And this is, might trip us up a little bit as we're reading if we're not prepared for it. So up until now, he's kind of uh, being very conversational in his writing. He's laying out, here's what I want you to do, here's why, and it's all kind of flows and one thing builds on another. And every week we talk about how his points are building, but not with the rest of chapter 12. So all of a sudden he shifted to this new style of writing. And now we're going to see today this like almost rapid fire series of commands. And so his entire writing style changes. And for most of us today, when we read this part, it feels a little bit weird. And I think the reason is this style of writing was a very popular style of writing back in the first century uh, in uh, Roman literature and Greek literature, but we don't really use this today. And so in this style of writing that Paul's using, we, we uh, see a quick movement from one topic to another, and there's no intention on behalf of the writer uh, to have a, a thread that logically develops and moves us from one dot to the next, All right? And I bring this up or talk about this because... This is a little unusual for us today. We look at a series of points and we uh, look at how they're connected to help figure out the greater meaning. And if we try to force that into the text, as many people have, then we can read something in here that Paul never intended for us to get. So we have to read this the way he would have intended it. His original audience would have been very used to this. They would have been very comfortable with this. And it was a very common thing for use in moral exhortation back in that day. So this was a common way of writing or speaking if the speaker or the writer wanted to urge his audience to adopt certain attitudes and behaviors. This is actually pretty fascinating from a linguistic perspective. We could spend all day on this, but uh, we're going to kind of leave it where it's at because uh, that's not the important thing. But what I want us to take out of this is that Paul here very clearly is urging his readers, his original readers, and by extension us, He's urging us to adopt certain behaviors and attitudes. And in doing that, he's leveraging Jewish tradition. He's leveraging Old Testament scripture. And he's leveraging the teachings of Jesus. And so we've got this style that might be strange to us, but it works even for us today because it keeps us on our toes. We've got one point, one command right after another, no discernible pattern in there. You read one sentence, you can't predict what the next one is going to be. And so what that does is it forces us to evaluate and look at each one of those commands on their own. All right, we have to deal with each one of these things, one right after another. So with that introduction here, we can go ahead and jump into the text. We'll start here with just the first sentence of chapter of, of verse 9 in chapter 12. Four words here. I love this. Paul says, love must be sincere. Love 
must be sincere. And so as I mentioned here, when, when Paul's using Jewish traditions, Old Testament, and teachings of Jesus to bring his point across, he jumps right in with the teachings of Jesus. As well as one of the biggest things that Jesus taught us is to love one another. He's echoing Jesus' commands to love one another. I'm going to flip back here and read to you from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. One of the greatest teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, is, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask any more questions. That was Mark 12, 28 to 34. If we jump over to John uh, chapter 13, verses 31 uh, to 35. It says, When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son, of Man, the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I wish to be with you only... I, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So here we have Jesus commanding us to love one another. This is a huge teaching of Jesus, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Curiously enough, though, when you study it out, the apostles in their writings very rarely uh, call us to love God. Very rarely do they call us to love God. They say that we need to have faith in God. They say that we need to obey God. But rarely, rarely do the apostles in the New Testament writings command us to love God. But when they're talking about our relationships with other people, when they're talking about relationships within the body of Christ, our relationships with people outside of the body of Christ, then the apostles exhort us to love them just as Jesus did. The Bible tells us to love one another again and again and again. See Romans 13, 1 Corinthians 13, Galatians 5, Colossians 3, James 2, and 1 John 2. So we've got this very important sort of... Um, all-consuming teaching from Jesus to love one another, and we know that, we memorize it, we're, we're comfortable with it, it's a wonderful thing, but love can be kind of a nebulous term, right? It can mean a whole lot of different things, especially when you get into the whole worldly view of love versus the biblical view of love, and we've done that a number of times here on Sunday mornings, even recently, so we won't work through that right now, but we do recognize that the, just throwing out there, you need to show love or, or be loving, this can mean a whole lot of different things. And so I think because of that, Paul has given us, or God has given us through Paul, this section of Romans chapter 12, so we can see exactly what that should look like. And we're going to go through this rapid fire series of commands. What does it mean to love one another? What does that look like? And he starts all of this off with the first sentence here, these four words, love must be sincere. It's kind of a fun fact here. We look at the underlying Greek. Um, <laughs> that word, when, we, when it says sincere, it's uh, uh, anipokritos. And it's literally saying not hypocritical. Right? Our love should be not hypocritical. And that makes sense. But it's pretty neat. When, when we look at that word, the root word, uh, that, that that Greek word comes from, it's talking about or it describes an actor playing a role on a stage, 
That's where the word hypocritical comes from. Because they're not really that person, they're, they're just playing the role. And a good actor can convince you that, that's, uh, that they're feeling something or, or they are someone, but they're still faking it. And Paul says, our love cannot be like that. No matter how good of an acting job we do, it's not going to be good enough if it's not sincere. Our love must be sincere. Now, with that groundwork laid, he starts working through what does that sincere love look like? And we've got, again, this rapid-fire series of commands. So we're going to go through them. It's going to be a little different than we usually address things on Sunday morning, but this is what the text looks like. Second part of verse 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And this is pretty straightforward here, uh, but we see another uh, instance here where this dualism in the Bible pops up. And, uh, you know, I've stood up here many Sunday mornings and pounded the pulpit here and said there is no spiritual gray area out there. Everything either serves to glorify God and, and work for his honor, or it works against him. There's nothing that fits in the middle. And so here, right here, it's saying the very same thing. If this dualism does exist, and it does, we must hate what is evil, and we must cling to what is good. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Be devoted to one another in love. Jesus has already taught us that we need to love one another, but here we see a, an order of magnitude that's clarifying that. It doesn't mean just show some love to your brother or sister every once in a while. This is saying go well beyond just simply loving one another from time to time. We need to be devoted to one another in love. That's for everybody in this room how we should be uh, addressing our own relationships within the church. Honor one another above yourselves. This one's very clear as well. Honor one another above yourselves. This ties back very nicely to last week's lesson, doesn't it? Don't think more of yourself than you ought to. Don't look down on your brother or sister. Honor one another above yourselves. The whole point of Christian love, it's agape, it's this action word that's selflessness. It's selflessly putting someone else's needs above your own. Honor one another above yourself. That's what love looks like. Then verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. I love this uh, statement here, keep your spiritual fervor. This is from the NIV. It's in the Greek, actually very difficult uh, to translate. And there's a number of uh, different ways you can do it. Different translations of the Bible will have something different, but they all essentially say the same thing. But another good way that you could translate this, maybe even more literally than keep your spiritual fervor, Paul is saying, be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. Be set on fire by the Holy Spirit. It's not that wording. It's saying we need to be passionate. There needs to be enthusiasm in our love for one another. It's not something we do grudgingly. Sincere love is passionate and it's enthusiastic. It's powerful. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. The first one I read this, I thought, well, this is very straightforward. We can just kind of read it and move on. But then I was tempted to just summarize up the first part at least with, have a positive attitude. And I thought, well, that's terrible advice. All right, that's this worldly trap we can fall into. And we're told, oh, have a positive attitude. Well, when we tell people outside of these walls to have a positive attitude, what we're saying is, no matter how bad the situation is, act like it's good, right? And then that intention will somehow make everything better. And I guess it's nice to be around somebody who's doing that. But that's not at all what Christianity tells us. We have a very, very good reason to be positive no matter what the circumstances are. We're not to have a positive attitude no matter what's going on. We're to have the mind of Christ. And that is even more positive in every single circumstance. Verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Share with the Lord's people who are in need practice hospitality. Now this is 
obviously as relevant today as it was back then, but it may have been even more important uh, back then than it is today. Uh, when especially, you know, it's really in two parts, share with the Lord's people uh, who are in need. Back when this was written, there was no system of social welfare in place, right? If you didn't have enough food to eat, you just went hungry and you could very easily starve to death or freeze to death or you'd just be at the mercy of uh, whatever uh, happened to be thrown your way. There wasn't a safety net that was put in place outside of your own family. And the fact of the matter is not everybody had a big family and not everybody had a family that could provide. And so what Paul is saying, you within the church, this is your family. You must take care of one another. You do not let your brother or sister go hungry. You don't let your brother or sister be cold. We have to share with the Lord's people who are in need. Very, very important back then, still very important for us to do today. And that second part about practicing hospitality, um, today I think sometimes we just reduce this to like snack time or having people over for food or whatever, and that's still a nice thing to do. But even back then it was a different world, and so if you were going to travel some great distance, there was not a a well-developed interstate system with, uh, you know, a Cenex and... Uh, Motel 6 or whatever at every single exit, if you were going to travel from one place to another over a great distance, there wasn't an infrastructure or place to support you. It could be dangerous. It could be a difficult journey. And so if you could impose upon someone else to put you up for the night, that would be a tremendous blessing for you. What Paul is saying is we Christians need to be doing this for others within the church. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Love is an action word. We have to take care of one, one another uh, enthusiastically. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Bless those who persecute you. Uh, and bless and do not curse. Verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Ah, and then 16, live in harmony with one another. So starting here with verse 14, blessing those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. This is contradictory to our human nature, isn't it? Somebody persecutes you, somebody does wrong to you. My first reaction, I don't know about you, is to you know, strike back. That's just a very human uh, response, a very normal thing to do. And Paul's saying that that's not what we're supposed to do. When someone persecutes us, we need to bless them. We need to respond uh, with them giving evil to us, we need to respond with love. Uh, and uh, we'll talk more about that in a few more minutes. When he said in verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. I think this should come naturally if we're doing everything else that Paul is telling us to do. If we're really involved in each other's lives, if we're really showing this enthusiastic, uh, sincere love to one another, we will be committed to one another in our lives. And so when our brother or sister goes through something that's very difficult, we'll naturally feel for them, we'll empathize, and we'll weep when they weep. And when they have a great victory, when something wonderful happens in their lives, that's the time that we would naturally uh, be wanting to rejoice with them and share in the joy of our family. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Verse 16, when it says, live in harmony with one another, uh, that first part of verse 16 this is kind of neat. Um, again, we find an instance where our Sunday school time really lined up with what we were going to talk about this morning. I could just kind of stop for a third of the sermon here, I think, if you were at Sunday school, but not everybody was there, so we'll um, we talk about it here anyway. So we've got this idea about living in harmony with one another, and we should do that. Paul tells us to do that. It's critical that we do that, but this is one of the more abused passages uh, in the Bible, I think, when I um, sort of think about what people tell us today, and we're often confronted with uh, some churches or you know people outside of the church or whatever saying, well, you know, society is changing a little bit, and we don't all agree with what's in the Bible anymore. And you know, when you stand on a biblical principle that causes conflict and it offends people, you should not do that. That's what we're challenged as. And so some folks have taken this passage and some others like it and say, well, the Bible says we got to live in harmony with other people. That means we really shouldn't dwell on any of these particular social issues that are offensive because that will cause disharmony. And so many churches have gone down the road of adopting some bad theology under the banner of Romans chapter 12, verse 16. But I would say this, nowhere in this Bible does it suggest the scope here 
should include compromising the word of God. It does not. We should live in harmony with everyone around us as much as we can, but living in harmony when we are told to do that does not mean compromise the truth of the word of God at all. Not one single word. And we know that because if we read the rest of this book, it's abundantly clear. This is Paul writing these words. Paul preached boldly, and there was not a lot of harmony that came as a result of him preaching the truth. And Paul did not compromise. We read about Paul being persecuted and having to leave one place, go to another, was persecuted again. He would leave there. One time, I know he goes into a city, he starts preaching the word of God, and they, people get offended. They drag him outside the city walls and uh, city gate, and they beat him until they think he's dead, and they leave him for dead. Paul gets up, he brushes himself off, he goes back inside the town, and he starts preaching again. Jesus was the same way. Jesus did not hold back. Jesus and everything that he said did not bring harmony because the truth of God sometimes does not do that. We are not called to compromise. And so what has happened, I think, is an attack, really, I think the whole point of political correctness is an attack on Christianity, but the world has hijacked this world tolerance and has created some kind of new view of it and it said, well, tolerance, you know, we live in a world where everybody has these different opinions and so we need to respect everybody else and stay away from anything that could offend anyone, unless, of course, the person's a Christian, then it's okay to offend that person. But under this banner of tolerance, I think the whole point is it's a call for us to compromise the truth that's in this book and we can't do that. Rest of verse 16. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So here when it says people of low position, uh, you could translate this as humble people. You could translate this even as humble things, but the context very clearly is people. And so again, this ties back to last week's uh, message. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. Don't look down on other people. This is unfortunately a trap that many, many churches fall into. Uh, A lot of times you'll get a a church together and it'll be a very nice church, a very um, healthy seeming church on the outside and maybe it is for a while, but then the people who go week after week become very comfortable with one another and they're all sort of uh, peers uh, in the world outside uh, of the walls of church and So the trap that often happens is people fall into sort of wanting and expecting a certain class of people within the church. And so when somebody shows up who doesn't fit that mold, they're greeted with coldness and no one welcomes them into the family of God. And that is a grievous, grievous thing because that departs from God's plan for fellowship. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. And this is very straightforward here. If someone does evil to us, we should not respond in kind. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Again, this is not a call to compromise. All right, if there's some point where you are confronted with uh, expressing the truth of the Bible or biting your tongue... Um, you know, and, and, and the truth of the Bible by expressing that may not be right in the eyes of some people present. We need to express the truth of the Bible anyway. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Again, not a call to compromise. This is a call for us to maintain our testimony. Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So again, as far as it depends on you, it's not up to us to compromise the word of God. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head, on his head. So again, here we've got this call to not repay evil with evil, and we have this very curious 
uh, sort of quote here in verse 20. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Okay, we get that. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. Okay, we get that. Not human nature, right? But we're supposed to show our enemies the same love that God has shown us while we were still his enemies. I think logically this makes sense. But then we get to this last sentence. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. This is kind of a curious one. I think we know what Paul means here, but the specifics of it, it's a little bit confusing. What exactly? Heaping burning coals on it. Like, what is he talking about here? And so when you dig into this or try to research it, I don't think anybody's got a very satisfying answer. Kind of a funny story on that. When Sierra and I were first married, we went to a church. It was a great church. Uh, We were in Sunday school one day, and for whatever reason, we were in this passage, and uh, we got to this point about... (laughs) Um, bur- heaping burning coals on, on their head. And, and the, the teacher of the class said, well, well, what Paul means by this is back then, uh, they didn't have real good heating in their homes. And so, so she said, well, you know, people would have these hats that were kind of like almost a sombrero. And so what they would do is they would take some of the coals from the fireplace and they'd put them on their hat and that would keep them warm. I think Sierra and I kind of looked at each other like, it's that, that, that can't be right. And she, the woman said it with a straight face. We didn't you know, say anything or laugh, but that was a running joke in our house for many, many years. And <laughs> I don't know for sure that's the wrong answer, but that doesn't feel right. <laughs> so I think what Paul's talking about here uh, is simply that... Um, you know, in the Old Testament, when you, or even in the New Testament, when, when we see these images of coals and fire, it's usually talking about judgment. And so I think what he's saying here is that when we do this, right, when we respond to our enemies with love instead of the way they have been treating us, and I think it shows us that when you do that, your testimony will eat away at their conscience. And that's just the truth. Romans chapter 2, verse 15, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts their consciences also bearing bearing witness. Verse 21, do not overcome or do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is tough, man, because this is not what comes naturally to us. At least it doesn't to me. I don't think it does to most anybody, and that's why we've got to read it in here, that's why we've got to pray about it and meditate on it and and work on it. But the fact of the matter is, it's a little easier in some respects to not be a Christian sometimes, especially when someone does harm to you. Because if you're not bound by this book, you can do whatever you want, you can do whatever feels good. But for those of us who do live by this book, the Bible teaches us when someone wrongs us, we don't have as many tools at our disposal to respond than the people of the world do. But God gives us the perfect tool to use, even when it may be one that requires much skill. All right, so I want to close with this, or sort of wrap up with this. We'll talk about a little bit deeper about repaying evil with good. Verses 14, 17, and 19, and 20 that we just worked through. Again, they're kind of scattered around because there's, not a, there's intentionally not a logical development with these points. Uh, but all these verses talk about non-retaliation. It all comes down to what he says here in verse 21, overcoming evil with good. As we've already hinted at here, already talked about, this is a uniquely Christian idea. I don't think there's any other school of thought in the world that says, you know what, if somebody wrongs you, you just go out there and you, you give them a stake. You know, you just love on that person. That doesn't show up anywhere else because that is just... So not the way uh, we are hardwired to think. Human nature is somebody does something to us. We need to get even. We want uh, justice served. We want um, uh, slights to be addressed. And so what we've got here is sort of this different system of interpersonal relationship or communication as a Christian than what the world uh, normally experiences. And we've talked about this before on Sunday mornings too. But the idea is usually we're used to like, when we're speaking to someone, responding to them the way that they interact with us. And so if we run into a person on the street and they're polite and they're nice to us, we're naturally inclined to be polite and be nice back to them, right? Because that's what came in and that's the sort of thing that goes out and that's all well and good 
until we run into somebody on the street who's maybe having a bad day or, or they're distracted or, or something else is going on and then maybe they don't behave uh, so nicely toward us. And so then if we respond back in kind, like, okay, fine, you know, I'm going to give you back a little bit of that. And what happens? They, you know, got something negative from us. And so they give something even more negative right back. And you wind up into this feedback loop and pretty soon things are a complete mess. That's the way people communicate. That's how we're taught to communicate. That's how we're hardwired. And I think that's why the world is the mess that it's in right now. This is why we have wars, why there's great misunderstandings. I think this is why the divorce rate is so high. The Bible says this isn't the way we're supposed to be communicating. And we're not supposed to be responding to anyone based on any input they've given us. We're supposed to respond to others the way God has responded to us. We have sinned against God. Right? We have fallen short of his perfect standard, and he has blessed us mightily. He has showered love upon us. And so in our communications with others, we need to be responding to other people the way God has shown love to us, not, have, not the way that person has spoken to us. So then let's talk about, with that in mind, living in harmony. Right? We're, we're told right there in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. I'm going to go ahead and put this out, out here, and you guys may... Um, I don't know. You, you may think I'm a little crazy here, but let me explain why. I, I will go ahead and say there is absolutely no good reason why any of us in this room should not be living in harmony with a fellow brother or sister in Christ. If you know Jesus as your Savior, there is no reason, no reason why you shouldn't be living in harmony with any other person who knows Jesus as their Savior. And the reason for that is Matthew 18, verses 15 to 20. Matthew 18, uh, yeah, verses 15 through 20. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. What God has given us is a very simple set of instructions here. If we're living by this book and there's somebody else in our lives that's living by this book and they're sinning against us uh, habitually or intentionally, here's a perfect res resolution to it. Go to the person, sit down with the book and say, hey, we're violating this passage of scripture here. And if they care about God, if they care about the Bible, that should win them over. And if you don't see it eye to eye, there's a path of escalation here. There is a, with multiple steps, it's a very, very good system. And so what happens here, if we follow Matthew 18 verses 15 to 20, then that should solve the problem every single time for believers. It does, right? It's a good system. That's why it's in the Bible. So after that, after we go through that, then there shouldn't be any Christian who is continuing to do evil to you. Shouldn't happen. We've got a process where we can take care of that. But if we're not following that process, if we've got a brother or sister who's sinning against us, you know, we just don't like confrontation that much, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow Matthew 18, 15 to 20 because, you know, I just, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to bring all that up. But, you know, if you're doing that, you're choosing to disregard Scripture and that's sin too. And when we do that, the problem sits and it sits and it festers. Or worse, we start gossiping about it with other people and that's sin as well. And the problem becomes bigger and bigger. If we're following what the Bible says, there is absolutely no reason why there should be any disharmony in our Christian relationships. And after that, I would say the only time that we just need to suck it up and take it on the chin is when there is an ongoing problem with an unbeliever. Because the fact of the matter is, if someone is willingly, continually sinning against us and they don't claim to follow this book, then Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20 doesn't, doesn't apply. It just doesn't, right? Because they're not going to care if you sit down with them and show them where there's wrong in Scripture. And so when that happens, the Bible says, listen, as much as you can in that, in that, in that situation, suck it up. Deal with it. Show that person love. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Right? We're going to uh, let God work on their conscience to help fix all of that. But when that happens, this idea of God saying we need to turn the other cheek and let something like that go, this can offend our sense of justice. Right? This is not normal. 
This can eat away at us. Like, I can't believe that person is still doing this. I can't believe what she did to me or, or what, he's, what he keeps doing to me. And so what Paul is saying here, if your sense of justice uh, is offended, Paul's not saying don't worry about justice. Paul's not saying justice is not important. Okay, and this is, this is how we can often interpret it. But Paul says, no, that's not exactly the problem. It's not that justice isn't important. Paul's telling us that justice is not yours to dispense. That's God's job. It's God who is to dispense justice in this situation. And so if we take a step back and we keep in mind what God's justice looks like and then think about the situation with an ongoing problem of a non-believer who's uh, willingly and continually sinning against us, what does God's justice look like? Well, we know that in this life, there is usually not immediate consequences for our actions. Usually there's not. You get away with doing bad stuff for a long time, and that's a blessing because if there was an immediate punishment by God for everything we've done, I think every single one of, this, uh, one of us in, our, in this room would have been dead uh, a, a very long time ago. God is long-suffering. He's not wanting anyone to perish. And so he lets it go. When he lets it go, when he gives it time, he gives it time, opportunity after opportunity for that person to come to a place of repentance because that's what he wants. And so when Paul is telling us here, to show love to that person, it's a very good thing to do. Justice is on the horizon, but we've got to remember the stakes are very, very high. So if we think of a perspective here. Um, we've got, you know, uh, if the offender is a person offending us or, or, or intentionally sinning against us as a Christian, then we've got Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20 to take, their pair of the, take care of the problem. But if not, uh, then then that doesn't apply. And so whatever that person has done, whatever they have stolen from you, whatever they have gossiped about for you or, or whatever problem uh, they've caused for you, listen, I mean, we're upset about the offense. I get it. But Paul says, don't worry about applying justice because that's, uh, that's God's job. Vengeance is the Lord's and justice is coming. Romans 6, 26, the wages of sin is death. And the wages of sin, that death, that's a spiritual death. That is a suffering for, for all of eternity. That's the justice that is on the horizon for the non-believer. Stakes are high. Listen, I don't know about you, but uh, you know, I've been knocked around in my life. I've had people do evil to me. I've had people do some great evil to me. And while at times I'd want to entertain some revenge fantasies or you know, kind of feel pretty good in my flesh if I saw something bad happen to that person. But let me tell you, I wouldn't want uh, an eternity in hell for my worst enemy. I can't imagine anything anyone can do to me where I would wish that person would uh, spend an eternity in a lake of everlasting fire. And so I think what Paul's getting at here with laying all this out is whatever that slight is that that person did for you or did to you, getting even for that. That's not the biggest problem that needs to be dealt with. Let God worry about the dispensing of justice. He says, you just take that opportunity to show love and to show mercy to that person the same way that God did to you back when you were an unsaved sinner. And maybe, maybe the testimony that comes out of that, showing God's love to that person will lead them to repentance and they would be able to be saved. So I think here we're going to we're going to go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Lord willing, we'll meet together next week. We may continue in with chapter 13, but I think it's also Sanctity of Life Sunday next week. And I've never given a message on that. And i um, thinking maybe we might do a topical message next week. We'll see what the Lord puts on my heart here. Uh, but either way, Lord willing, we'll be able to be together next week and uh, we'll worship God together again. Would you close with me in prayer? Heavenly Lord, we thank you so very much for letting us be here today. We thank you for the opportunity to read your word, to study it, and to learn about it. And Father, I pray that uh, you would help us to get wisdom from the things that we have talked about. Lord, thank you for explaining exactly what love in action looks like uh, in a Christian environment. And we just ask that you would challenge us with these exhortations from Paul. Help us to put them into practice in our lives that we might be able to be better sons and daughters to you as a result. Lord, we love you dearly. We ask that you would please get us all home safely and bring us back together to worship you again as a church family next week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.